I'm a paleoecologist, which means I study the ecology of the past. So it's a lot like forensic science. You basically go out and collect clues to what the ecosystems were like through time. Um, we can't observe our study systems, so we have to piece together what the plants and animals were, what the climate was like, um, using the little bits of material that they leave behind. So some of the work that I've done um, has looked at the consequences of the extinction of Ice Age megafauna, these really big charismatic animals like mammoths, mastodons, giant beaver and ground sloths. And for decades a lot of people had spent quite a bit of time looking at why those animals went extinct, but no one really asked the question of well, what happened afterwards, right? And so if you, if you look around us, all the species that you see now um, co-evolved with these really large animals that are now extinct. And so the work that I've done show, has shown that once these animals went extinct, it triggered a period of what I would call ecological upheaval, that for a thousand years the ecosystem uh, really was quite unlike anything we had seen before or after. And it really shows that there's this period of adjustment and there were a lot of ecological surprises. And that the, the, the plants that survive today um, are different in the absence of those animals. Um, and so I think this has really important conservation relevance because our large animals are some of the most threatened we have on the landscape today. And things like elephants, rhinos, you know, we're losing them at you know, you know, vast rates. And the ecosystems that they leave behind will notice when those animals are gone. We can compare what I have in my hand of a phalanx to other known species just by basing what this looks like. It's most comparable to boss and bison. So this summer, um, I took a graduate student, Jeff Martin, and an undergraduate, Chase and Frost, out to Wind Cave as part of Jeff's PhD project, looking at how bison are responding to abrupt climate change. And uh, Jeff is, you know, was raised on a bison ranch, and so he is very interested in how paleontology can be used to help inform modern, the modern bison industry. When I was in sixth grade for a Christmas gift, my parents gave me a calf. Uh, they purchased a calf just for me. Her name is Gummy Bear, because <laughs> I was in sixth grade, why not? And she's my first, she's still with me. She's my best producer. Um, she's also the largest of my females that I have. Uh, she's, al she alone has produced 15 animals. I'm intimately back and forth between academic and a rancher <laughs> myself. Mm -hmm. I want my animals to succeed. I want everyone else to succeed. And without the cooperation of the entire industry, there won't be an industry. Um, one of the major issues that I'm trying to tackle is with climate change, it's not all of North America getting hotter. Places are getting colder, some places are getting hotter, some places are getting more precipitation, places, some places are getting less. And so, you know, there are many mechanisms by which climate change can affect animals, right? You can have this direct effect of temperature and moisture on the animals themselves, which you know you feel if you walk out on a hot day, you know you can you're, you're experiencing climate, you know directly. Um, but there's also the indirect effect through the plants, which are the food that these animals are eating. And so, what's really exciting about a place like Wind Cave is, it's it's like a little collector basin that's trapping little bits of the ecosystem over thousands of years. They just wash in, and in some cases, we have help in the form of little rodents and things that are scavenging around and bringing parts of the ecosystem into the cave for us. So um, at Wind Cave, what we're really interested in doing is, is putting together multiple components of that ecosystem. So we have people working on, on, um, on reptiles, we have people working on the carnivores, people working on the bison, like Jeff. Bones tell us so many things. Um, bones, if they're preserved, can tell us the lifestyle of an animal and how it was living its life, if it was a runner, if it was a digger. Like the beaver, uh, it's a big swimmer and it also lifts a lot of mud. So he has a pretty wide uh, humerus. And what we're finding in the cave, which is at least um, 10,000 years old based on some of the animals that we're finding in association with the bison, including peccaries, camels and horses. Mm -hmm. They all lived here in North America before Europeans got here. Based on those, it's at least 10,000 years old. But we have over 25 species of vertebrates already, and we haven't done anything with pollen or the vegetation yet. And that's what we're working on currently. Um, we have to process all of the dirt and everything else that's messy. Yeah. 
so we can get just a pollen. You can find little mice toe bones. They're really cute. I think that if you try to even study our world um, just as a snapshot in time, um, you, there's a lot that you can learn, but there's, there's so much that you're missing out on. And so understanding how change through time um, and how that long-term perspective can help inform just how we understand the living things around us and how they operate, but also how we can better inform conservationists and, and land managers and people dealing with really practical issues. So there's, I think the past can both inform just the basic science of how we understand the planet and its living things, but also how we manage those living things and conserve them for the future.